Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different uh, tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own tongue. They were astonished and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Asia. Um, I'm sorry. Phrygia. Phrygia? Anyway. Uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near uh, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, each, uh, both Jews and converts. Cretans and Arabs, uh, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own language. They were all astonished and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Uh, but some sneered at them and said, they're drinking new, uh, drunk on new wine. And uh, you'll have to uh, forgive me for getting caught on uh, Fergia. <laughs> Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. I looked it up and now I've forgotten it. <laughs> I just looked it up this morning. Um, by the way, for those who are interested in their Greek mythology, King Midas was the uh, king of Fergia. It didn't shut off. It takes a couple of minutes. Okay, well, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, uh, our Heavenly Father, you have given us your spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. And as your children, we come to you and we want to say thank you for giving us the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to say thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. And we say, come, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to point out a couple things if you have your... Uh, your study guide, you can write these down if you want. But first of all, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. If you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So, what did Jesus do? He said, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I think that this promise created a sense of expectation. See, Have, has anybody ever promised you something? I am going to take you to Disney. No, I'm not going to take anyone to Disney. But has anyone ever said I'm going to do something special for you, right? Then what do you do? You begin to expect it. See, the thing is with humans, uh, we have the tendency to not follow through on our promises. And sometimes that's accidental and we just can't do anything about it. But sometimes it's on purpose. And so we get, get this sense of expectation and it's never fulfilled. But here's the thing with God. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do something, right? So when we look at God and we look at Jesus and he says, in a few days you are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You think that created a sense of expectation you know, in, in the tale of John, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So here we are. The disciples are about to watch Jesus go up into heaven. They had no idea it was going to happen. And when it did, they were like, uh. <laughs> and the angels came down and said, why do you have your mouths open? Just <laughs> close them and get on with life because God has something for you to do. And so the Holy Spirit was part of that. And the promise created a certainty in the minds of the believers. So it created a prom promise created a sense of expectancy. 
The promise created a certainty in the minds of the believers. Uh, when God promises something, God is going to do it. He's never failed on any of his promises before, and he's not going to fail again. Uh, by the way, you know, one of the promises is that Jesus is going to return someday. So between the day of Pentecost and Jesus returning again, what are we left with? We're left with the Holy Spirit. We're left with a sense of expecting. And the Holy Spirit gives us power today to live our lives, right? To live holy lives, to be able to speak to people about Jesus, to have a, a certain something that is missing when we do it ourselves. So this explains their behavior. What did they do? They went back to Jerusalem. What did they do? They prayed. And between when Jesus went to heaven and the day of Pentecost was about 10 days. So he left after 40 days and came back, and the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And so what you have is a 10-day long prayer meeting. Elders, would I get fired if I called on one of those things? Be close. <laughs> no one would come, right? Can you imagine stopping what you're doing, ceasing all your activities, and staying together in one place for all of 10 days, night and day, doing what? Praying. One of the things that has gone by the wayside in American Christianity has been the corporate prayer meeting. And it used to be that believers would get together in corporate prayer meeting and they would expect God to do awesome things. And unfortunately, I think we kind of killed it by making it into a laundry list and praying who's who, you know, uh, who can outpray the other person. And I don't think they were doing that. I think they were honestly seeking God's will. I think they were honestly seeking God. I think they were honestly taking the time to look at their lives and say, okay, something has got to change. What do we have to do to make room for the Holy Spirit? You've heard it said that God is a gentleman, right? God never forces us to do something that we don't want to do. He can nudge us. He might take the cattle prod to us a couple times, but, but God never does something against our will. Don't you hate free will? Free will is just this frustrating thing. But, but God wants us to yield our wills to him. God wants us to make room for him and what he wants to do in our lives. That's what I think that they were doing in those 10 days. They were making room for what God was going to do. And if you think about it, uh, 10 days, wow. That seems like forever. Most of you are thinking, yeah, this sermon's gone on forever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but the reality of it is, these promises created a certain uh, certainty in their minds. If Jesus said it, it was going to happen. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So often what happens is when we look at this passage, we kind of focus on one issue, and that's the hot-button issue of tongues. And I'm not going to discount that in any way, but I want you to, I want you to see this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's not about a particular gift. It is about the power of God falling on you. Okay? And that means that God is going to use you in any way he feels like it. And that day happened to be the Pente day of Pentecost. It was one of the three holy days that all of the Jewish males were supposed to be in Jerusalem. So people from all over the world, there's 15 language groups that are represented here. And none of them had regular contact with Galileans. And we're going to see what, uh, this is part of the confusion of what happens. People come and they go, what's this? We're hearing them in our own language. How can this be? How can this be? And so uh, the main understanding of the purpose of the Holy Spirit would be power.
power to witness in whatever vehicle he uses there. And Jesus lays out a strategy. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we see in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit seems to come in f- to four different ethnic groups. So let's uh, cover these really quickly. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. They, that's the, the Jews at the time, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. So that's the Jewish. That's Jerusalem. Then Samaria, in Acts chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. After they went down there, and then what had happened is the disciples had heard about the people in Samaria coming to know Christ as Savior. So what happened is they sent Peter and a few other delegates down there to lay their hands on the the, the Sumerians so that they would have the gift of the Holy Spirit. After they went down there, they prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not come down on any of them yet. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Peter and John laid their hands on them and and they received the Holy Spirit. So that's the Samaritans. Now, we talk about Judea, Samaritans, uh, uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46, we have Jewish converts. These were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. So, watch the progression. You have the Jews. Okay. You have Samaritans. And Samaritans claim to be Jewish. They, they claim to have the real religion. Uh, so they were of Jewish background, ethnic, ethnically, but, uh, okay, so distant cousins of the Jews. And then with uh, Cornelius's house, what happened is you had Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. See the progression? It's moving further and further away from simply just the Jews. Now, Ephesus. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. And Ephesus was a Gentile city basically. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. So you can see Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And you can see Jesus, this, this rock in the pond and the ripple that's going out here as the Holy Spirit comes upon people. When Peter gets called on the carpet because he baptized the people, of Cornelius' household. His defense is, I couldn't refuse them baptism because they spoke in the tongues just like we spoke in tongues. So you see what Peter is saying is, I can't deny the water baptism because they have the same spirit we have. And the proof in the pudding was that they had spoken in tongues. So, the church had prayed for the Holy Spirit. So we have the Jesus promised the Holy Spirit and then we see the church prayed for the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 14. They were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So this whole idea of continually, it's, a, it's an attitude. The fulfillment of Jesus' promise depended on their actions and they understood that. Here's, here's something I, I, I've never really fully understood. Sometimes God just takes over. He does whatever he wants to do, whatever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it, any time he wants to do it. And that really interferes with life, doesn't it? <laughs> and then there are some times when God says, I want you to, and before I bless, I want to see this from you. And the only thing I've thought about this for a long time, and the only thing I can think of is that God wants us vested in the work. Does that make sense? Okay. If you had a box that could replicate anything, and you had a gold bar, and you put the gold bar in the box, and now popped two gold bars, you could keep doing that into infinity, right? Until you became the wealthiest person ever on the face of the earth. Here's the problem. Would you appreciate it? You might enjoy being the richest person on earth, but you really wouldn't appreciate it. 
there's a certain appreciation that comes from old-fashioned hard work, sweat of the brow. Isn't there? And when you earned it, you know you earned it. And it's like God's saying, hey, you have to earn this. But I think God says, I want to see you put a little effort into this because when you put effort into it, you own it. So Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem. He didn't tell them to pray. <laughs> That's interesting. They figured that out themselves. Stay in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. So here they are. They're praying. They're taking care of some business. And uh, what happens? They prayed for the Holy Spirit. Uh, the importance of this drove them to be constantly seeking God continually. Do we have that hunger and thirst for God in our lives? Do we have that hunger and thirst, that expect expectation that when you come here into church on Sunday, the Holy Spirit's going to fall on us? They were united. When the day of Pentecost came, it says they were all together in one place. They were expecting something to happen. They welcomed the event. They welcomed the event. They wanted the Holy Spirit to come upon them. If they didn't, They'd have been somewhere else, wouldn't they? But they obeyed Jesus and they stayed in Jerusalem. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? Whew. Yeah, talk about that. <laughs> this is a watershed moment in history. Before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had been with them. From that day of Pentecost forward, the Holy Spirit is now in them. Get the difference? Now, when you accept Christ as Savior, you invite him into your life, whatever words, whatever expressions that were used, think about it this way. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you didn't just get Jesus. You got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us it's impossible for anyone to come to faith and belief in, in Christ without the Holy Spirit at work. Okay, so when you became a Christian, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you also got the Holy Spirit. But there seems to be this, um, this equilibrium that happens. You know you're saved, but you're struggling with sin. You, you, you know God loves you, but you just, you struggle with that because maybe you feel like you fail or fall too many times. And it's interesting that the whole old holiness people like A.B. Simpson and, and John Wesley and, and, and many of the others looked at this and said, you know, there's a time after salvation where a person finally gets it. The aha moment. That time when they yield to the Holy Spirit you know, it's one thing when we yield to the message of salvation, that's awesome. That is truly an awesome event. But when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and you yield to the Holy Spirit, that's, that, 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 that really takes it to another level. Uh, there's a book called Move. It was done by one of the big churches that everybody talks about. And uh, anyway, they, they, they wrote this book and they said that as, as, as important as salvation is, the hardest part for a human is sanctification. It's easy to be saved, right? All we have to do is believe. But sanctify? Oh, no, 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 that's meddling. That means God takes over our lives. That means I'm not in charge anymore. That means... Woo Heaven, glory, now. What an awesome thing that is. So here they are, they're praying, they're expecting, and, and, and this is the moment the Holy Spirit changes from being with them to being in them. Now we have what is called the manifest presence of God. Don't you love those big theological words? Actually, these aren't the big theological words. We could talk about the histography uh, of the, <laughs> the book. Anyway, uh, manifest means to make known. 
In other words, the real. And the presence of God is a real, personal, transformational encounter with God. You're driving down the road. The red lights come on behind you. He hits the siren. Woo! You pull over. That is a transformational moment in your life. It's either going to slow you down, cost you more on your insurance, maybe lose your license, you know how fast you're going. I think, what is 25 miles an hour the speed limit here in Pennsylvania? A transformational moment. Are you going to ignore when the lights go on in the... No, because if you don't, then you really do have a transformational moment. You're hauled off to the county jail. And if you're unlucky, the judge gives you five to ten in the pen, right? And the reality that we have here is when the Holy Spirit falls upon us, when the Holy Spirit gains control of our lives, when we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, nothing can ever be the same. Nothing. So, here's the difference. When you're saved, Jesus joins you in the car and you're driving down the road and you and Jesus are having a great time. Woohoo! Jesus is in the car with me. I'm saved. When you allow yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be sanctified, you realize, you know, Jesus, maybe I'm not the best driver in the car. Here, you take the wheel. And now, you're enjoying Jesus because he's driving and all you got to do is enjoy the ride. Because regardless what is going to happen in your life and regardless what is happening in your life, God knows what is best. And you don't have to struggle against that. You don't have to... You don't have to wonder why, God. All you have to do is say, Lord, what are you going to do? What awesome thing is this causing in my life? What's this going to do for me? The promise of the Holy Spirit becomes the personal Holy Spirit in the believer. When the Holy Spirit appeared in power, the third point, there were three signs. And someone has said, God gave them something to hear, something to see, and something to experience. But he gave them three signs. First of all, the wind. In the Old Testament, the word raka is translated spirit. It's also translated wind. So this image that we have of the wind is, is a word for the spirit. Remember when uh, God created Adam? And Adam was basically a lump of clay laying on the ground. And it says the Spirit of God entered into Adam and he became a living being. Okay? So God breathed his own life into Adam and Adam woke up and off he went. He became a living being. Uh, remember the story of uh, Ezekiel, dry bones. Valley of dry bones. God says, hey, can these bones live? And I can see Ezekiel going, okay, God, this is a trap, isn't it? If I say yes, uh, I'm in trouble because he's going to ask me how. If I say no, he's going to tell me I'm of little faith. So Ezekiel took this really politically uh, neutral <laughs> stand. Only you know, Lord. <laughs> I love it. So God says, okay, speak to the bones. So he spoke to the bones, and what happened? Muscle and sinew and flesh and skin came upon the bones. But they were still dead. And then God said, prophesy to the wind, the spirit. And the spirit of God moved in out of those dry bones, what had been dry bones, that had now become flesh and blood. And breathed life into them, and what does it say? They stood up as an army. What an image of the Holy Spirit coming. If you think you're dry bones this morning, if you think your life is empty, if you're so exhausted, if you are without energy, if you just feel like God hasn't been in your life, guess what? He has been. 
And he's working to put flesh and blood on you. He's working and he, and he wants to breathe his spirit into you and bring you alive in him. And I think he's just waiting for us to say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. The fire. Remember the fire? Hmm? I remember when um, Solomon dedicated the temple. Do you remember that? The, the glory of God filled the temple. And <laughs> but more spectacular than that is fire fell from heaven. And how often was fire the symbol of God in the Old Testament? The burning bush. What should I say? The, the bush that was on fire that didn't burn. We call it the burning bush, but it didn't burn. The key here, oh, and, and speaking the real recognized languages of the people that were present. So, let's see if I can uh, k- kind of give you an illustration here. Let's say you were to walk in this morning to the UN. Something the UN's doing business today. Let's say you walk into the UN, and uh, there's a guy from, we'll just pick out Mozambique. And you start speaking to him in his native language. He's going to look at you and say, Aren't you one of those crazy yinzers I've been hearing about? How do you know my language? Okay, that's going to get his attention. And and say you walk in with with someone else, and he walks up to someone who, uh, let's see, pick a Swahili. We'll stick with Africa. Someone from that language group. And they start speaking Swahili. And the guy goes, how in the world are you speaking my language? This isn't possible. You're from Western Pennsylvania. You'll get it. You know, there was confusion and there was astonishment and there was amazement among the people who heard them. And there's kind of a reason for that because Galileans were not known as the smartest people on earth. They were kind of provincial. They were backwater. They were, they were uh, uh, not up on all the technology of the day. They were just people going about trying to live. They had a distinct accent that made them recognizable. I, I'm suspecting that even though they were speaking the languages of the day, they still spoke with their Galilean accent. Which is why they went, hey, hi, these guys are from Galilee. Obviously from Galilee. Listen to that accent. How do they know our language? I mean, people from Galilee don't study our language. They don't have a reason to know our language. How do they know our language? And so there was all this confusion and all this. But, but there are 15 different languages present. Okay? The Galileans were speaking in their languages. And it says in verse 12, they were amazed and they questioned, what does this mean? Something's going on. What does this mean? And Peter is going to stand up and connect this event to Joel's end time prophecy about the Spirit of God falling on his people. And then he's going to connect it to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So, how do we get this baptism? I, 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 I'm getting to this point and I'm saying, okay, how do I do this? You know, uh, four easy steps, right? Uh, how do I do this without conveying the idea that there is a way we can manipulate God? Okay. These are steps that I've just seen in what we've been talking about this morning. So this is not a way for us to manipulate God. However, I do think this is a way for us to make room in our lives for God. That makes sense? And again, I, I think there are times when God wants us to do that. And it's got nothing to do with, well, if we do this, he's going to do that. God's not a candy machine. Okay? Now, the first thing I want you to observe here and understand is, is this filling of the Holy Spirit is not automatic. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is not automatic. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul told the Ephesians, Do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So why did he tell him... Be filled with the Spirit. I know he's saying, don't get drunk. (laughs) 
something better. <laughs> By the way, it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, they were accused of being drunk. And Paul here in Ephesians is saying, don't get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. Why does he say you have to be filled with the Spirit? He says, because that's not just something that's you walk around with, so to speak. Let me scratch that. That's not just something that happens. Okay? Wow. I just opened a can of worms and a lot of theology. <laughs> can you guys set that aside? We'll, we'll talk about that in a few more weeks. But anyway, um, <clears throat> the decision to get drunk is a decision to lose control. The decision to be filled with the Holy Spirit is the decision to surrender control. Get the difference? People who drink, what do they drink for? Well, some are drinking to forget. But eventually what happens is they know that alcohol is going to take over. That's why they used to call them spirits. The old English people, they called them spirits because when a person got drunk, it was like a spirit had entered them. So the decision to, uh, to get drunk is a decision to lose control. The decision to be filled with the Holy Spirit is a decision to surrender control. And there's a huge difference there between losing control and surrendering control. Losing control, you end up doing something you don't want to do. Surrendering control is you're doing something you want to do because you want God to take over. And sometimes I think, until we get to the particular point where we're sick and tired of trying to drive our own car, Sick and tired of driving it off the road and into the ditch. Sick and tired of, of hitting all the telephone poles in life. Sometimes I wonder if we don't get that to the point where we're sick and tired of all that before we get to the point where we say, okay, Lord, <laughs> I can't drive. My life's a mess. Take over, please. And so we surrender control. So, step one, <laughs> faith in Jesus. Now, you're going to say, duh, pastor, <laughs> duh. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is for believers only. That sound, that, does that make sense to you? God wants to fill his children. He wants to fill his people. He will use people who don't believe in him, but they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That is a special, awesome privilege designed for God's children. So, you have to have faith in Jesus. Step two. Expect God to give you this feeling. The disciples expected it. Jesus said, hey, we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What did they do? They waited for him. <laughs> they expected it. They're like, yes, Jesus is going to give us his Holy Spirit. God's going to give us his Holy Spirit, and, and this is going to be awesome. I don't think they ran around saying everything is awesome, but hey, you know what I mean. <clears throat> they were expecting, and they believed in obedience, and they, they acted in obedience, and they believed that what Jesus said was going to happen. So, there was this expectation. Step three, they intentionally welcomed the Holy Spirit. This is going to require yielding and cooperating. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Paul is going to say in Romans chapter 12 to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Well, it happens when the Holy Spirit takes over. It happens when you saturate yourself with the Word of God. It happens when you yield yourself to God. I know a lot of Christianity believes in Jesus, but they have never come to that point where they have yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit. They've never yielded themselves to God. And I think maybe part of the issue is they think something weird is going to happen. 
there's a there's a there's a movie, um, <clears throat> and a superhero family is living in this house. One's strong and the other one's stretchy. And yeah, you know what I mean. Throughout the movie, there's this little boy on a tricycle out on the front. And at one particular point, the, the, the man of the house looks at him and says, what are you looking, what are you waiting for? What are you looking at? He says, I'm waiting for something awesome to happen. And in the end, there's this big fiery crash. The airplane falls. Whoo, falls on the kid and the family. And of course, they're safe because one of them puts up a shield. And after the fire burns out and you, 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 the little kid's on his bike and he raises his hand and says, that was awesome! And I'm thinking, wow, if we could only have that expectation to be able to be in church and go, that was awesome. To, to, to be in the presence of God in your prayer time and your Bible reading time and come away from that going, that was awesome. And the Holy Spirit wants to fall upon us. And I love the images that, that the scripture uses, fall upon, pour out. If I were to take this bottle and I were to take the lid off and I were to empty it, pour it, guess what? I don't have any control of it again <laughs> until it hits the ground. And that's what it is. The Holy Spirit is poured out into our hearts. In Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... He does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Well, after verse 9 where it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. I kind of want to put a hard stop behind that. <laughs> but I'll keep moving. The fourth step. And this one seems so simple. Ask. Jesus, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, If you then, who are evil, know how to give gifts, good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? None of you are evil fathers. Are you? Well, I think what Jesus does is he often uses comparison. So if we compare ourselves humanly to an awesome, almighty, divine God, by comparison, <laughs> we look pretty tainted, don't we? In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, we'd be evil in comparison to almighty God. And he says, listen, if your child asks for an egg, are you going to hand him a scorpion? Eh, no. If your child asks for something that is it's good, are you going to give it to him? Well, yeah. You're going to give it to them. He says, okay, if in comparison you're evil compared to God, how much more good do you suppose God is? If, he'll give you, if you ask, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? So, here we are. What is your heart cry this morning? What is your prayer this morning? You want to be blessed? That's great. You want to be saved? That's a good starting point. Do you want life to go well for you? That's fine. But do you want the best? Are you willing to say, come Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you will continually refresh us with your Holy Spirit. That you would baptize us with your Spirit. That even as we <clears throat> go about uh, our routines of the days, that your Holy Spirit would be in control. That you would bring into our lives people that we can talk to about Jesus. 
that you would give us the strength to, to see needs and meet them. To be able to speak a, a kind, a prophetic word that leads someone stronger relationship with you. Father, that your Holy Spirit would fall on us in power. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.